everybody. Welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We've got a great show for you tonight. We're going to be diving into the topic of meat glue. That's right, meat glue. So if you don't know what meat glue is, stay tuned because it might just be wrecking your gut. It might be a reason why you've changed your diet but continue to struggle. That's right, this one industrial additive is a bear. It's a monster and we're going to be diving into why and uh, what you can do about it and how you can recognize it in your food and so many more in-depth uh, tidbits for you on meat glue tonight. So question of the night, can you detox from meat glue? Do you need to detox from meat glue? But before we even go into that, let's kind of ask the question, what is meat glue? Now, what you're looking at here in this diagram is very much what meat glue looks like. It comes, uh, industrially speaking, you can actually purchase it. You could go online and you can buy this. Now this otherwise known as microbial transglutaminase. That's its technical name. Okay, microbial transglutaminase. Now there are different kinds. So the one of them is, is microbial transglutaminase. And this is actually derived, it's bacterial derived, so it's derived from a bacteria. And then there's another kind of meat glue that's derived from the serum or, or blood, if you will, uh, typically of, of pig or cow. So porcine or bovine blood product. And so what they do with this is they dry it out and it forms a powder as you can see here, and then they take this powder and they sprinkle it onto tiny bits of meat. So imagine you've got a bunch of meat bits and uh, or meat cubes, right? And so you sprinkle this powder onto those meat cubes and then you, you compress them together, you wrap them together and you mold them into a particular shape. Okay, that's, typically that's why I call it meat glue because it glues meat together. What this stuff does, it's an enzyme that connects, it, it creates bonds between the proteins in the meat so that it glues them together. So again, most meat glue today in the industry is this stuff right here, microbial transglutaminase, although uh, this particular, so for, for example, if you're in the EU, if you're in the European Union, this stuff here is banned. You, you, you won't find it in your food, but you might find this in your food. So again, it's banned in the EU, the bovine porcine derivative, and partly because of the risk of contamination of bacteria. So they banned it there for safety purposes, but this stuff is not. This again is from a bacteria and it glues meat together. Now it doesn't just glue meat together. If we look at other things that it can be found in, okay, so all your potential sources of meat glue here. So meat obviously, so you might go to a restaurant, right? This is one of the reasons why you may have heard me say from time to time, eat where there's a chef, don't eat where there's a cook. And, and this, is, this is my policy on eating out. I generally won't eat where there's a cook, and that's no offense to cooks, but generally, as a rule of thumb, the chef owns the restaurant um, or owns the facility And because they own the facility, they take pride in what they produce, so there's a higher quality, right? And so they're gonna use real meat, they're gonna make you a steak. If they're gonna make you a ribeye, they're gonna produce you a steak, it's gonna be a steak. Where, when there's a place where there's a cook, this is usually corporate owned. So it's usually like your chains, uh, your chain restaurants. And there, a lot of the motto for these corporate owned places is the taste has to be the same, no matter where you are. So if you're eating, for example, at one restaurant, chain restaurant in California, it has the same taste, the same flavors, the same consistency, the same texture, the same predictability as if you're eating at that same restaurant in New York. And the only way they can accomplish this is with enzymes and food additives and, and, and preservatives and other things. And so that's very, very common that where there's a cook, where there's a chain, right, you get 
your steak, you might order it and think you're getting a steak, think you're getting a real steak, but what you might be getting is bits of meat that are glued together. Chicken nuggets, hot dogs, sausages, deli meats, as well as boneless wings. Those of you who like the wing places, and then if you like the delis, the roast beef, the turkey roast, the gyro meats, like all these can be pasted together and, and reconstituted meat product, right? It is glued together with this industrial enzyme it's used as a food additive. And by the way, meat glue does not have to be listed on the label. That's the scary part about it. So if you're flipping over and you're trying to read the ingredients just to make sure you're not getting exposure to meat glue, the problem with that is they don't have to list it on the label. And so this is another, just another reason for me personally why I don't like to eat out because I don't like to run the risk of this. And we're going to get to those risks here in just a minute, so stick with me. Now, meat glue can also be found to glue uh, or improve texture in dairy products. So you may be thinking, well, I'm a vegetarian or I'm, I'm a, you know, a lacto-vegetarian or whatever it is. You're not safe because we also have meat glue in things like yogurt and ice cream, uh, in a number of variety of different creams, cheeses, frozen desserts, and dressings, common places we find meat glue. And then also processed foods, even your vegetarian processed foods, so your baked goods, your pastas, cereals, tofu, especially, and this is where I want to really highlight it here today. Let's make that more legible. Let's darken it up for you. So processed gluten-free food is a big one. And I'm going to show you why in just a minute. So if you've been diagnosed with gluten sensitivity or celiac disease or non-celiac gluten sensitivity, pay very close attention as we, as we talk about this tonight. Now, in addition, you can find it in a lot of your seafood. So if you like the sushi bars, for example, the crab meat and some of the fish are actually, you know, constitu con the constituent of that is, is imitation, so it's glued together. Your fish sticks are glued together. Sashimi and crab cakes glued together. Where you're, again, aside from just buying these things in the store, right, you can also, at restaurants, you get like the meat combination platters. So like when they wrap that bacon around that sirloin, right, a lot of times they adhere that bacon to that steak. They stick it to the steak using meat glue. So this is where you get like bacon wrap fillets or meat combinations. Again, turkey breast, chicken breast. Um, if, if it tastes like a hot dog, kind of the general rule of thumb is if the chicken breast or the meat on the plate tastes more like a hot dog than the actual meat, then it's probably meat glue and you're probably getting hammered. And so spit it out. If it tastes like a hot dog, spit it out. Uh, unless you're actually trying to eat a hot dog, in which case, good luck to you. But I, I don't, I'm not a really big fan of hot dogs either. Um, so anyway, those are your primary sources of meat glue. Now, what are your risks of being exposed? If you're exposed to meat glue, what are some of the problems associated with getting exposure to meat glue? There are a number of different ones, and this is especially true, again, if you have a diagnosis of celiac or if you are non-celiac gluten sensitive. Or otherwise sometimes referred to as NCGS. Okay, so if you if you know this is true about yourself. You know, if you're celiac, you've probably been to a GI doctor, you've probably had a scope, you've probably been diagnosed. Now, if you're non-celiac gluten sensitive, you know, the best way to know about that is genetics. And that's doing, uh, specifically doing what's called HLA genotyping. Uh, because if you have the HLA genotype for, uh, for gluten sensitivity, not just celiac disease, but for non-celiac gluten sensitivity, then what happens is every time you expose yourself to gluten, the genes activate to produce inflammation in response to that exposure. So again, whether you've had the GI diagnosis of celiac or whether you've had genetics done appropriately, um, either one of these are scenarios where you'd want to avoid gluten. And if you, again, if you fit that, then these are the potential consequences. Now, if you're not celiac or you don't have gluten sensitivity, there are still consequences and we're going to talk about that too. But number one, we know that it increases permeability of the gut, okay? So we know that gluten 
uh, or meat glue exposure can increase the development, the risk of the development of leaky gut. We know it makes proteins more allergenic. Okay, and what does that mean? It, it basically, it takes friendly proteins. Remember, it's meat glue. What does it do? It bonds and binds protein together, right? So you might have protein A from a food that you're eating, and then you get that meat glue, and it forms a novel new protein, right? So it leads to uh, a neo protein, a new protein. And your immune system might not recognize that. And so that's what allergenicity is. Your immune system recognizes that it's a foreign because it's forming a new protein from that. And that's going to create allergenicity. So it makes you allergic. So let's say you're eating, for example, a steak and it's made out of meat glue and, and meat tidbits and you react to it and you don't feel well, right? You may not be reacting to the meat directly. You may be reacting to again, to the new proteins that are formed as a result of that meat glue binding and uh, homogenizing that meat together. And we can also see an increased gluten reaction. There's some research sh coming up now that, that shows that meat glue um, can actually activate celiac disease or gluten sensitivity. So it actually can exacerbate it and make it worse. That's why a lot of people that go on the gluten-free diet but buy a lot of these products that are processed that contain these, you know, this transglutaminase or this meat glue, continue to have persistent symptoms. And, uh, and, and, and again, we have the science that kind of backs this up, right? So it activates or contributes to or continues the perpetuation of a celiac-like response. We know that meat glue can alter protein function. Remember, this, this, this shape in the, in the center of this is a protein, right? And proteins fold. And so the, the, the morphology or the shape of proteins dictate the function. If you've ever heard me say square tires, right, don't roll. Structure dictates function. And so the structure or the shape of a protein as it's folding dictates its function, how it's going to work in your body. Well, if you add an enzyme from the food that you're eating that alters the shape, right, turns that round tire into a square tire, right, that now won't roll, then you have altered protein function. And if that protein is an important protein and its job is to help you digest your food, for example, now we run into problems. And this can happen in the GI tract, so altering a protein function. Now, we also know that, that your body will that meat glue itself as a foreign entity will sometimes actually contribute to your immune system re attacking it so there's a there's a process called loss of tolerance and we'll talk about that in just a minute too but this is part of how that happens is you lose tolerance to, to it and so then your immune system recognizes it instead of looking at it as food it actually starts to attack it so again these are ways that meat glue can actually impact and affect your health and coming backward here just a little bit, remember, these are the foods that if you're eating these on a consistent daily basis, regular basis, then you're running a great risk of not recovering, especially if you're a gluten-sensitive individual and you're trying to overcome the years of gluten-induced damage. Again, a lot of people, what do they do? They go gluten-free diet, but their diet is full of processed food. So they go to that grocery food aisle, right, that says label gluten-free. The gluten-free food aisle in the grocery store is predominantly this stuff right here. It's this junk, right, and it's got this potential for meat glue, not, and not just meat glue, other food additives, dyes, preservatives, etc. And so then they don't actually end up having any great degree of recovery and so that's, that's part of the problem. So here's some things I wanted to show you as well on that same note. So I wanted to come back over here and talk about some what are the researchers are saying. So this, was, this image here was, was published in the journal Frontiers in Pediatrics um, by Matthias Torsten and, Lerner, and uh, Aaron Lerner. And so this... These guys are super brilliant scientists, and they're doing a lot of research right now into the arena of autoimmune disease, celiac disease, and as well, the meat glue and the food additives and the food preservatives as being triggers. 
And so you can see in this diagram, you've got food additives. This is not just meat glue. So let's just point that out too, that it's not just meat glue, although meat glue is one of the food additives, not labeled on the, on the package, but the food additives. Um, and then a lot of your engineered microbes, okay? So engineered microbes, that's, that's microbial transglutaminase. That's what that is. So it creates a food product that is being added to food. And so what happens is you get MTG. And what is MTG? That stands for microbial transglutaminase. So if you remember, I wrote that on the board earlier, that word, microbial transglutaminase, this is meat glue, right? So in a nutshell, this is your meat glue. Yeah, and there we go. And so what does meat glue do? It in increases PTMP enzyme activity. What, what does that mean? Um, it means it, it changes the nature of proteins, as I mentioned earlier. This is just a fancier way of saying it. And this is happening in your intestine, right? And so that increases antigen modification. What does that mean? That, that means it, it basically, through changing and altering of your proteins, it creates the higher risk of developing an allergy to those proteins, which increases the ability of this allergy complex to, to bind to what's called MHC. Now, we're getting pretty technical here. MHC stands for major human uh, or um, uh, major histocompatibility. It's, it's a type of receptor that sticks off of your immune cells. So you can see this is the receptor sticking off. And so this protein, which has been modified, okay, is now being recognized as foreign, and that's why it's binding to that M MHC complex. And so when that happens, we lose tolerance. We lose the ability to tolerate it. And so we get T cells, T cells are immune cells that actually create a response against that protein. And then the byproduct of that response, we're getting intestinal damage that can actually mimic celiac disease as well. So not only um, may you already have celiac disease as a result of gluten exposure, for example, but going and eating these types of foods can actually contribute to celiac-like disease. It's actually been one of the things that's been identified as a trigger for villus atrophy. So meat glue in and of itself. So even again, this is what I said, even if you're not gluten sensitive, if you're not a celiac, you may still be developing intestinal damage as a result of the way the body looks at meat glue and as the way meat glue processes and changes proteins inside of your GI tract. Now, one of the other things that, we, uh, that we've seen here is that we know that these food additives create, okay, um, so you see here, changes in intestinal tight junction permeability. So what's the tight junction? This is the protein anchor that keeps your gut sealed, okay? Associated with industrial food additives explains the rising incidence of autoimmune disease. Remember what causes autoimmune disease for most people, the primary precursor to autoimmune disease is leaky gut. So again, that's that permeability, right? Intestinal permeability or hyperpermeability. So these food additives, okay, alter or change tight junctions. So you can see what I've got highlighted here, tight junction leakage, leaky gut, is enhanced by many luminal components. What's a luminal component? Those are the substances that come through your intestines, the intestinal lumen. So commonly used industrial food additives being some of them. So the, the MTG or meat glue is a commonly used industrial food additive. Glucose, salt, emulsifiers, organic solvents, gluten, microbial transglutaminase. Again, this one right here is meat glue. And nanoparticles are extensively and increasingly used by the food industry, all of the aforementioned additives increase intestinal permeability by breaching the integrity of tight junction paracellular transfer. In essence, what they do is they break a hole into your gut lining and they allow what's in your gut to leak into your bloodstream. So these additives are a problem, not just meat glue, but other additives as well. So this leaky gut, what is this in your gut? You know, this is poop. Right, so poop is now leaking into your bloodstream, if you want to put it graphically. Um, you get poop leaking into the bloodstream, but you also get all kinds of bacterial toxins and other, other waste products that are produced in the gut. So again, we know that this happens. Uh, we know that those additives are creating and increasing that. Now back to meat glue. 
again, these are some of the, the process. So we have the food industry processing our food. Okay. And this is one of the reasons why, you know, if you've listened to me or watched me for any length of time, I've always said, eat real food, don't eat out, minimize how you get your food from the hands of other people and control your food, control where your food comes from as much as possible. But if you're buying and eating real food, you, you'll go a long way to improving your health. So you can see here, industrial food items, the potential pathogenic activity. So these are all the different known ways that meat glue can potentially create a problem for you. Number one, it enhances bacterial growth. Remember what microbial transglutaminase is. It's a bacterial enzyme. And so it can enhance bacterial growth. And if you've ever heard of conditions like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you know, that can be problematic. We also know it increases gliadin uptake. So um, it increases how well your body will uptake that gluten and present it to the immune system. So it can actually enhance the immune system response to gluten. We know it affects the mucus quality. That's the lining, the layer that lines the GI tract. It's uptake by mucosal dendritic cells. These are specialized immune cells focused and concentrated in the mucosa of your gut. And when, they, when it's uptaken by those, it, it basically it, it bogs them down and it preoccupies them. It creates luminal resistant isopeptide bonds. Um, so basically, it creates protein bonds that make it harder for you to digest your food, okay? It enhances permeability of the gut, as I just showed you with leaky gut. It's transported transepithelially. So what that means is these, these compounds are transported across the epithelial barrier um, into, again, leaking through subepithelial, transepithelial. These are just different mechanisms by which it gets from your gut into your blood and immune system. And, uh, and then that, it creates an immune response and then antiphagocytic activity. So it shuts down uh, in part, it, it creates problems with your this cell type called a phagocyte and induces specific antibody production. Okay, so it makes new proteins that cause the production of new antibodies because of, the, again, the cross-linked complexes um, being immunogenic or being uh, causing an immune response or causing an allergy. So I know that's, that's somewhat technical, but the potential pathogenic activities in a nutshell it is it makes gluten reactivity worse. It can increase things like SIBO. It enhances bacterial uptake. It causes leaky gut, and it creates new proteins that can alter uh, the way your immune system is reacting and responding. Basically, it creates new allergies that your immune system is going to react to. So you don't want to get exposure to this stuff. I mean, if you had it once in a while on a, on a you know, accidental type basis, it probably wouldn't be as big of a deal. But if you're, if you're eating all these processed and packaged foods, um, you're, you're going to run into some problems. And you can see here, for this was published in the Journal of Agriculture and Food Chemistry, transglutaminase, again, meat glue, treat, the treatment of meat glue, using meat glue on wheat and corn, that's what maize is, corn, prolamines, these are the wheat and corn glutens, okay, of bread, increases the reactivity in celiac disease patients. So if you're buying, for example, you're buying a corn-based gluten-free bread, right? It's been treated with meat glue. What, that, what that's saying is that by treating it with meat glue, it's changed the protein in that bread and it's increased your immune system's reactivity if you have celiac disease. So those of you with celiac disease or a gluten issue, if you're buying that gluten-free bread made out of corn, um, that's what this is saying is that if that bread was treated with this enzyme, then you're gonna react to it. Okay, so celiac disease mediated by IgA antibodies to weak gliadins and tissue transglutaminase. As tissue transglutaminase is homologous to microbial transglutaminase, so there's an enzyme that we make called tissue transglutaminase, or TTG. And what this microbial transglutaminase is, is, is it's homologous, so it's very similar, right? And so what, the problem with celiacs is that their own transglutaminase is, is reacting with gluten, creating a gluten that attaches to the immune system and creates a response. Well, what they're saying here is that that same thing happens when you add this microbial transglutaminase, it enhances the reactivity of gluten towards your immune system. Okay, so you can see here, microbial transglutaminase used to improve foodstuffs quality. So it's used as a, as a, as a food additive, right? Could elicit the immune response of celiac patients. So in this study, prolamins extracted from wheat and gluten-free breads were analyzed. 
and IgA titers were higher against prolamines of, of, of microbial transglutaminase treated wheat. In essence, when they treated the bread with the meat glue, the immune system of celiac patients reacted more aggressively. So again, if you're celiac and you're getting that exposure, it could be the reason why you may still be struggling in your diet. And this is why I'm, I'm highlighting this and talking about it so much. And you see here another study. Okay, this was published in Autoimmune Reviews. The industrial food additive microbial transglutaminase mimics tissue transglutaminase and is immunogenic in celiac disease patients. So again, part of the, the way that celiac disease develops is through this enzyme in our intestines called transglutaminase. Well, this, if we add microbial transglutaminase to our diets, it mimics our own transglutaminase and it makes, our, it makes that gluten protein even more reactive, even the gluten proteins that are found in corn. Because oftentimes, You'll hear that corn is gluten-free, although corn does have a gluten. It's called zane, and that using that enzyme with that, with that corn gluten makes that corn gluten more reactive. And we see that same thing with a number of other different proteins. It makes those proteins more reactive. So you don't want to, my point is, avoid meat glue, right? So how do we do that? Well, the first thing that you, you do is you eat real food. Because if you eat your own real food and you can trace where your food comes from, you don't have to worry about it. But if you're going out to a restaurant or if you're going and you're eating out, maybe you're traveling, maybe you're on vacation, these are the big things that you want to look at as potentially as avoiding at all costs. So now we're going to open it up for any questions that you have in regard to meat glue. Uh, let's see here. Is meat glue used in salmon? You know, it's used in, it's used in a lot, you know, I wouldn't say specifically salmon if, if we're talking about Again, if we're talking about a chef, if we're talking about a cook, what, what are they using? Are they making, are they patching salmon together? I've not seen that as much as I've seen uh, more of your red meats being patched together, glued together. Um, but I wouldn't put it past them because they are using it in fish like crab. So um, again, I would, be, I would be cautious about that. Um, how can we, uh, let's see, we'll get to that maybe a little bit later. Have you, um, what's the best way to tell if ingredients use meat glue? That's a great question, Marcus. The problem is the, the food manufacturers don't have to display meat glue as an ingredient in the food. So the, the best way is to know where you might potentially find it. So that's going back to you know restaurants, uh, processed food, fast food. Those are all going to be places that you can pretty much guarantee the use of meat glue. So the, avoiding those types of restaurants and those types of places, in my opinion, is going to be crucial if you're trying to overcome you know years of gluten-induced damage. This, so cell cultured fake meat, does it contain meat glue? I don't know. Honestly, I haven't. Uh, the cell cultured fake meat, I, I, I haven't even looked at it at this point. It's not widely available. Um, I know it's going through the rounds right now. It's something I would advise anyone to stay as far away from as possible. Um, you know, anytime we see this historically, right? So Anytime somebody comes out with this processed item and they say, hey, this processed food is better for you than this non-processed food. And look at the examples that we've already seen. Uh, so, so remember when, when butter was demonized and they rolled out hydrogenated vegetable shortening and vegetable uh, butters, right? So if you remember like the, the Shed spread and the Mazzola spread and some of these brands really early, early on where they were hydrogenated uh, vegetable oils. They were taking corn oil and soy oil and they were forcing hydrogen into those oils with a, with a metal catalyst, meaning they were using a heavy metal to force, chemically force hydrogen into these plant oils and calling that safer than butter. And what did we find out? We found out after years and years of, of, uh, of consuming those products that they increased the risk for cardiovascular disease and other forms of inflammation and inflammation-based illnesses. That's, that's an example of when we were told, hey, eat this, not that, right? What else? We were told, 
that, uh, that artificial sweeteners like NutraSweet or aspartame and sucralose were good for us, right? And go ahead and eat those. They're better for you than regular sugar. Well, first of all, sugar is not good for you, but these processed sugars are far worse. Many of them are neurotoxins. Many of them are genetically modified. So it, it's, um, it's, an, it's another classic example where, where we were told eat this, not that. And, and again, the outcomes were, weren't, weren't good. They were, you know, what they told us was actually inaccurate and incorrect. Uh, and we see that time and time again in the food industry. Um, we saw that with don't eat fat, right? Eat carbohydrates. Fat's bad, carbohydrates good. And we went through the 90s thinking that, uh, you know, most people did anyway. And what happened? Diabetes went up, weight gain went with obesity rates soared, heart disease soared, cancer soared, you know, all the prima primary inflammatory degenerative conditions soared as a result of the dietary advice so anytime you see something new coming out, like a meat glue or a cell cultured meat or like this impossible uh, plant-based burger stuff that, that's being touted as healthy, like my advice is run as far away from that stuff as you can. Let all the other humans be guinea pigs that want to be guinea pigs. And, you know, when their health is destroyed or deteriorated as a result of believing that garbage hype, um, you'll be sitting on the sideline being glad that you didn't participate in that, in that mass experiment. Um, so, you know, again, Filene's asking about how do you determine, you know, what might contain meat glue before purchasing. I would just say when it comes to, when it comes to it, I would call the manufacturer. If there's a real, if there's a particular product that you like and you want to use it and you want to continue to use it, I would call the manufacturer of that product and ask them if they use within their processing, if they use microbial transglutaminase. If you can't get a direct answer, I wouldn't buy it. Uh, what's your opinion on Ayurveda? I, I think it's great. I think Ayurvedic medicine is a is a wise system of medicine. It's certainly, um, in my opinion, a lot more helpful in regards to, to what we're dealing with in the world with the massive quantities of autoimmune disease and chronic degenerative inflammatory disease. It's certainly a much more comprehensive approach, let's say, than traditional allopathy where, where everybody you know, tries to use a drug to chemically manipulate a symptom versus people paying attention to the world around them and how they feel when they eat food and how they feel when they exercise and how they feel when they don't sleep. Like Ayurveda is just, in my opinion, it's just a system of medicine that's common sense. It, it applies fundamental things that we should all be applying, which is what or what? What are the seven fundamentals of good health? Well, the first is the right diet. It's eating, it's eating nutritious food, eating real food. The second is sleep. The third is exercise, the fourth is sunshine, the fifth is clean air, the sixth is clean water, and the seventh is stress management and, uh, and having purpose in life. So if you've got those seven things dialed in, generally speaking, you're going to be pretty healthy. And if you're not, you may be missing some key areas and it might be helpful to work with somebody uh, who's an expert to help you understand what you might be missing. How and what can we eat? This is so much to learn. So is it better to go to a meat market um, I love chicken and yogurt, so now no yogurt. Possibly, that's, that's true. Now, could you make your own if you love it that much? Yeah, I mean, here you have to remember, what have, you, what have we all done as a society? We've traded convenience for poor health. I mean, if you really want to summarize it and put it in a nutshell, you, we've traded convenience for poor health, and that is the convenience of accessing food 24-7, any kind that you want, but that food is all produced on an industrial scale. It's mass produced. And in order to do that, you know, these mass production companies use these types of enzymes, food preservatives, and food additives. They have to. They couldn't produce in small batches and, and you know, in the, in the way that we are demanding as consumers, the way that we're demanding food. So you have to look at the way um, you live your life and you have to say, do I want to trade this convenience for, uh, for health points, right? It's a trade-off. If you opt for the convenience, you know that you're giving away some of your health and your stamina. And if you know that and you're willing to make that trade, then that's your choice. But if you don't want to do that, then you have to take more ownership of where your food comes from and how to produce it. And again, I'm not teaching this tonight to overwhelm any of you, but again, many of you go to that gluten-free food aisle and what are you buying? You're buying the box cereals, the box pastas, the box breads, Right? You're buying the things that have the highest or the highest potential for being contaminated with, with meat glue, and that puts you at risk for not having recovery. And if we look at the studies on, on celiacs, and this is true even in my own clinic, the, the studies on celiacs and people with gluten sensitivity 
show that the vast majority of people embarking on a gluten-free diet have a benefit, but that benefit is minimized because of their foods that they're choosing in lieu of, and many of those foods are contaminated. Many of those foods have you know, gluten cross-contamination, meat glue contamination, food preservatives, food additives that cause leaky gut, uh, pesticides and other ingredients that are, that are um, you know, detrimental to the microbiome of the GI tract. And so those patients never recover because their guts are already destroyed and then they're trying to heal and repair by eating junk food. And it's just, it, it doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, it, it doesn't matter how inconvenient it may be for any of you listening to this. It doesn't work that way. If you want to heal and you want to repair, you've got to dedicate time to learning about this or you'll, you'll stay in, the, in, in that struggle. You'll stay lost in the mix. Um, is it true that beef grass-fed included is almost never fresh? I heard that it's at least three weeks. Yeah, they dry age it. Um, that's what makes it tender. That's where when you dry age beef, you don't have to use all the tenderizers. You know, those chemical tenderizers aren't very good for you. So a lot of a lot of people will dry age cold air age, dry age it, and uh, that, that allows it to be more tender. And it actually get, does give it a better flavor as well. Is meat glue in all deli lunch meats? Pretty much. I mean, I, 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 I just wouldn't eat that junk, um, you know, unless you can verify that it's not. But in my experience, it, it's pretty much in all of them. Um, Are there any brands or suppliers of meat or dairy that are safe, that are certified to be free from meat glue? Not to my knowledge, although I would just say, um, Schultz, I would say that if you're looking for you know, valid companies where you can buy real food, this would be like your local farmer's market. This would be like your local, uh, potentially your local butcher if you have one, or your local farms that actually will do um, where you can buy like a, a quarter, you know, they do what's called cow sharing. So if you're trying to buy beef, for example, you can go in, you can buy a fourth of an entire cow and they'll process that meat for you without meat glue. And then you'll, you just have to put it in your freezer and you eat it as, you know, as you do. Uh, and that's what I would encourage many of you to do. That's probably one of the most economical ways to go about it. Is meat glue found in cosmetics? Is this something that can be absorbed through the skin? To my knowledge, no. Nobody's studied whether or not it's absorbed through the skin. And to my knowledge, I, I haven't seen anything about, about it being present in cosmetics. So I can't, I can't make that claim that it is. Um, is there any effort to require food label transparency or to ban meat glue? Um, also, with the Toxic Free Food Act recently introduced in the House of Representatives, help protect us from meat glue? Probably not. Um, there's no great effort, to be honest with you. And the reason why is industry. The industry, look, look we've got, just in the U.S. alone, we've got, you know, what, 340 million citizens here. And those people have to be fed. And in order to feed that many people, you, ha you, you know, the trade-off is mass farming, mass production farms. Now, could it be done in a regenerative way? It could be, but there's no will to do it because these companies that own the farmland and that run the farm operations are, are very complacent with using glyphosate. They're very complacent with genetically modified seeds. They're very complacent with the food processing and the additives because they're making a lot of money doing it and they don't want to restructure their business or their company. Um, it's just not something anyone is going to want to do. So th there's no will to do it. As a matter of fact, there's the anti-will against it because by doing it, it would, it would, they, everybody would incur more cost. And usually with changes like that, they have to be forced and mandated. But, you know, again, when you have, you know, when you have what we have in today's world, which is just the vast majority of politicians aren't on the straight that, you know, who goes into politics? People that go into politics generally, uh, well, I don't even want to go there. I don't even want to get political, but I think you guys get my gist. Is it possible for uh, meat glue to be in fruits and vegetables? Um, you know, again, I would say where you'd want to look out for is if you're, if you're buying like processed, you know, so like your, your highly processed, you know, vegetable puree mixtures and things of that nature, that's where I might suspect something like a meat glue to being added as a texturizing agent, but fresh fruits and vegetables, no. Is there a credible visual source of meat glue that I can share with family members? I, I don't know what you mean by credible visual source. 
of Mink Blue. Maybe clarify that, um, and I can give you a better answer. Is it, is it meat glue? Cheryl wants to know, is it meat glue in Chinese restaurant food that makes us sick? It, it can be, but it's also um, MSG. A lot of people get, um, you know, get severe neurological complications when they go to the Chinese restaurant because of the, the heavy, heavy monosodium glutamate use. Um, is there is there meat glue in organic dark chocolate? Shouldn't be. It's not anything I've ever seen. Um, but again, I, I don't I don't want to say no because I, I can't say with 100% certainty that there couldn't be. Yeah. So so forest squirrel is saying avoid meat. You did not take part in. Well, that's you know part of why I, I grow my own. Part of why I have my own animals is um, is that very reason. I I, I really don't trust. If you look at, at trust in society today, look what's happened in the last hundred years. We've given our trust to farmers. Well, what happened? The farmers, you know, took took government subsidies to grow the crops that make us the sickest, right? They took government subsidies to grow genetically modified corn, sugar, soy, uh, and and hybridized wheat sprayed with tons of chemicals, and they took those subsidies to grow those foods because they made more money to do that. So the government incentivized food growth that actually led to the deterioration of the health of us, right? So here we had this trust in our government. We also had this trust in farmers. That trust was breached. How many farmers today are farming conscientiously? There are very few regenerative farmers. I mean, if you want to look up in your area, look for regenerative agriculture, farmers that are doing regenerative agriculture, that that's really, in my opinion, where farming needs to go. Now, that being said, we've trusted our government to take care of our food needs. And what they've really basically done is they've slowly poisoned us. And they've slowly, um, through, in my opinion, poor ethics, allowed more and more food additives, more and more chemicals into our food with the guise that they're safe. And if you look at who owns many of these chemical companies that are food additive manufacturers, they're drug companies. So it's, it's, it's a classic example of the fox in the hen house. So the, the, the pharmaceutical manufacturers are producing the poisons that we spray on our foods. And when we get sick after eating these poisons for years, they're also producing the drugs that we end up having to take or that many people end up taking uh, in an effort to get better, right? And, and so it's just, I don't know, it's a lifetime value customer acquisition issue, right? Where you, you start the babies off on baby formula from genetically modified corn syrup and synthetic vitamins and you graduate them up into hot dogs and chicken nuggets that are processed in mass scale and then you graduate them up into you know more and more foods as they choose as adults fast food processed food and again it's just a vicious cycle of, of uh, uh, again of, of complete distrust and so at this point my, my point in saying all that was not to demonize anyone but just simply to say I don't trust other people's food I don't trust other people with my food. And I just encourage you guys to take a greater degree of ownership of where you're sourcing your food. You don't have to own a farm to take greater ownership. This is what that means is you could join a food co-op where they're growing food in the local community organically. And you're just a part of the person that funds that. And so you get organic produce fresh to your door, seasonally delivered. That's the kind of thing I would encourage many of you to do because the more you take your dollar away from these mass corporate companies that are producing this junk and you give it to that farmer who's regenerative farming and doing it right, right? How do, how do we make this paradigm shift? We talk with our dollar bills, we don't talk with our mouth. There's tons of people on Facebook right now moaning and groaning about how bad things are, but that doesn't accomplish anything, right? At the end of the day, what, what talks, right? Money talks and you know the rest, BS what? It walks, so you've got to talk with your wallets and, and your health. Um, and so anyway, Let's see here. Visuals of meat glue found on Google could be photoshopped. Is there a medical or clinical source to know how that it could be credible and not photoshopped? No, not really. Um, not to my knowledge. Yeah, so Barb's saying, if, if not able to buy a quarter of a steer and no large freezer, what would we look for when buying beef in a store, grass-fed and grass-finished? Yeah, that's it. You'd look for grass-fed grass finished and you you try to find out what farm it was being produced on and you might even do a little bit of homework on that farm and see what you know what their philosophies are and whether or not their philosophies match yours um 
and, and then support, again, a support a business that, that, um, that has a like mind. What would be worse if we had no choice on the, on the road? A McDonald's burger patty or the bun? It's all bad, man. I'd say if you're on the road, you have a choice. Don't eat. I, I fast all the time when I travel. I mean, when I, when I go places and I'm on the road for, for several days doing conferences or, you know, uh, uh, out teaching other doctors or other folks, you know, we fast. I fast on a regular basis. Uh, and so, you know, I'd rather fast. I'd rather skip the meal than end up compromising you know, my health. Because when you're traveling, usually, what is that? That's airplanes. So you're on this tube full of germs, full of people, where you run the risk, the greatest risk of your immune system being compromised uh, or being exposed to something. And then if you eat food that compromises your immune system further, you just increased your risk for the development or for, for something bad to go wrong. So fasting, in my opinion, would be the better option over either of those. I don't believe in choose. I don't believe in, and people say, pick your poison. I would say, why? Pick, pick something healthy instead. Don't, don't, don't justify poison by picking the lesser one, right? Because that all you're really telling yourself mentally is that it's okay to eat poison, right? And you're, and you're telling other people around you that that's okay. So if you've got children that are watching you, you know, you're, ju that you're justifying that for them. Okay, let's see. Yeah, meat, glue, and pets food. Yeah, that's a, that's a problem. This is one of, I mean, look at pets. If you look at, at, the, at the veterinarian industry over the past 50 years as well, look, we didn't have dogs with cancer and heart disease and taking diabetes medication 40, 50 years ago. Not to any great extent. This goes back again to the trust. Not only are they poisoning, you know, the, the mass scale production food creators are poisoning our animals as well. So you, yeah, I mean, I feed my animals. I have, you know, I have a German shepherd and I have a, a little Yorkian, we feed them raw food. Um, so, you know, the, the, there are some brands of kibble that are better options, but ultimately for, for, for canines, raw food is a, definitely one of the better ways to go if you, um, if you can stomach it yourself. Let's scroll, is pig blood sausage okay? You know, it just depends on, on you know, is, is there something inherently wrong with pig blood sausage? Not necessarily, I would say one, it depends on how well you cook it. And two, it would depend on the source of the pig. If the, you know, there are certain kinds of pigs, you know, if that pig were raised on a mass commercial farm, I wouldn't eat it. Now, if it was a wild boar or wild animal that was shot like wild game, yeah, I mean, that, that, I would say that would be a much better bet. Is hamburger, even the grass-fed organic kind, high in meat glue? No, not typically. Again, when you're buying, typically at the grocery store, when you're buying uh, meat, you're getting meat and there's less, it's less apt. I mean, you're less apt to get the meat glue, especially if you're buying grass fed, grass finished and paying a premium for it. Let's see, is there a link between gluten sensitivity or celiac with histamine intolerance? Yes, there is. Um, we're actually getting ready to do a major show on histamine. So if you're not subscribed to my newsletter, make sure you do that. You can visit me at glutenfreesociety.org and you can sign up for our newsletter there, but um, we're gonna do a major show on that. And if you're on our newsletter, you'll be, well, well, you'll be given well advanced notice of that. And we're also getting ready for those of you, we're getting ready to make a shift. Um, we're moving a lot of our, our video and our platform off of social media. And, and the reason why is I'm tired of being censored. When we, when we have a topic that we need to talk about and I need to educate you, I don't wanna be censored. And I don't wanna worry about my entire platform going down uh, I don't want to worry about, uh, you know, problems of that nature. So we're, we're working on a technology solution that will allow you to come and visit us at Gluten-Free Society and still partake in these live questions and answers, but using our own technology base. So sign up for our newsletter and we'll keep you informed when we make that switch. What supplements can one take to strengthen their bones and their jaw? That's a little off topic, but I think the bigger question is why would the bones in your jaw be weak in the first place? Um, and, and so there are a lot of different supplements that help with bone formation, but if we're just talking about basic bone formation, collagen, vitamin C, zinc, copper, calcium, manganese, boron, and vanadium are all really good bone building nutrients and so in that regard, a good, if you check out my multivitamin, my multinutrients, it's, it's, it's full. It's got a little bit of all of those things except for the collagen. And we do have something called ultra collagen that you could take as well that has bone collagen. 
in it. And those are all good ideas to help support healthy, dense bones. Let's see here. Just keep scrolling down on both sides for me. Do veggie burgers have meat glue? Um, you know, I don't, I don't, I can't say, I can't speak of every brand and say, yes, that one does, or no, that one doesn't. But I would suspect it. I would highly suspect it. Um, with anything, again, any of the soy-based, veggie-based types of concoctions where they're trying to make it look like a hot dog, taste like a hot dog, taste like meat, the, the probability of meat glue is pretty high. Uh, would meat be, glue be found in frozen vegetables? Not to my knowledge, Louise. I wouldn't, I wouldn't suspect frozen vegetables as being a major source of it. If you don't have freezer space, oh, so that's a comment. Somebody's chiming in. Yeah, and I, that, you know, somebody mentioned they didn't have freezer space. And one of the things I would just say, um, if I'm just trying to give you good advice, buy a freezer. Um, they're relatively inexpensive nowadays. I mean, you can go over to a major hardware store and you can buy a, a smaller deep freeze for under $200, especially if you pick up, uh, pick up one on sale. And, uh, and then you just have to have room to put it, just have a little space either in your garage or a closet in your house and, and plug that thing in because you want food security. I mean, this is, a, the time, this is the time in the world today where we live, you want to always have food security. What I mean by food security, we're, we're, we're living in a time where shortages can actually happen. And, and uh, it's not that we've seen, you know, you, you saw last year where there were some shortages in the grocery store shelves were uh, on, on days they were vastly emptied. Um, but food security is just, you know, when you struggle with food sensitivities and food allergy or celiac or gluten issues, food security is important because you don't want to get stuck in that, you know, do I eat or do I starve situation because there's not enough options for you to buy that are healthy options. So having that freezer gives you that security in that, uh, in that backup that you may, you may need one day. Hopefully you'll never need it. Hopefully none of us do, but you know, the old saying is uh, chance favors the prepared. So do your best to get prepared now so that if you need it, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, can I repeat the name for meat glue and ingredients? Yes, microbial transglutaminase, MTG, is the name of, of meat glue typically. Um, let's see here. Would meat glue be found? I say I answered that one. Uh, my opinion on grounding. Oh, that's really off topic, but I like it. I, I go outside all the time. I like grounding. I like being you know, barefoot in the grass. Um, and there definitely are positive health benefits to doing it. So I like this question. Lynn says, I took the genetic test in it and it was positive with two of the gene HLA-DQ2 uh, alleles. How come the rest of my family are not sick like me? I have three sisters around 50 to 60 years old and my mother 92 and in good health. It's, it's, it's very... It's a very interesting question, and I think when we try to compare ourselves to others, it's, it's oftentimes it's a losing comparative because you're uniquely you. Um, but but it, is a, it is a good question, and it's a fair question. And I think from what I've seen, and I've been, you know, I've been practicing for over 20 years now, and what I've seen is that a lot of times one person in the family may be sick. The others, maybe they're healthy, but they're not Healthy on the surface is not the same thing as healthy. So what do I mean by that is many people don't complain about problems and they're very stoic and they just push through their day and they, you know, they don't complain and they look healthy relatively on the outside. And I'm not saying that your family is this way, Lynn. I'm just simply saying this has just been my experience and that a lot of people ask me this question and say, well, this person's healthy. And when I talk to that person, that person's not actually healthy. They're just not very verbal with their health complaints. And so they, they don't really talk about it openly or they're not, they, you know, they, they're, or maybe they're not in such a severe way um, as, as some people can get. But there's this saying, you may have heard it, the canary in the coal mine. And some of us that get the sickest uh, are the warning 
beacons for those of us who aren't quite as sick yet, meaning that some people have constitutions that are a little bit stronger and you may be the one that in your family doesn't have that. And there may be some also some history there with you where you took more antibiotics or where you were exposed to certain elements or certain aspects, certain toxins. And so that accelerated the process of by which your health deteriorated. It's just hard to say because everybody's so uniquely different. Uh, let's see here. So back to that, yeah, that osteoporosis uh, question. So I have osteoporosis because of my condition. I know I'm off topic, but I want to order supplements. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the best thing you can do, Mary, in that regard is get tested. Ask your doctor to order a micronutrient analysis on you where, they're, where he's looking at whether or not you have deficiencies of certain nutrients because you, you may need calcium and you may not. So many people think that osteoporosis is a disease of calcium deficiency. And if that were true, then there would be no osteoporosis because all we'd have to do is give everyone calcium. So it's not that simple. It's, you know, your bones are built from proteins. They're built from micronutrients, the vitamins and the minerals. And so knowing whether or not you're low in those is going to give you an advantage so that when you're ready to buy those supplements, you can get super, super specific. But if you're just buying generalized and you just want to buy something to support your overall good health, I recommend a really high quality multivitamin to start with. So somebody's asking about um, zinc as a sunscreen. Will taking it as a pill act as a sunscreen? No, it will not. Um, taking it as a pill is not going to give you um, the same kind of sun protection. Now, zinc is an antioxidant, so you should be aware that it drives an antioxidant system called superoxide dismutase, which does protect your skin from radiation. But taking oral zinc supplements is not, it's not the same thing as applying zinc oxide as a sunscreen. That zinc oxide is going to be a lot more effective from the acute exposures, especially if you're on a boat or at the beach or something like that. Let's see. Would meat glue proteins pass through to breast milk? Potentially, we nobody's really studied that, Angelia. So I, I can't say with definity that that would happen. But we know this: um, we know that gluten passes through in the breast milk, as do many other allergy complexes that form in, in allergenic moms. And so that that it's a it's not a leap to say that meat glue could show up in the breast milk. So can you detox meat glue? So they, yeah, that was the title of tonight's show. How do you detox meat glue? What's the number one rule? The first person that can answer this question properly, uh, we're going to give away a free gluten-free warrior t-shirt. Um, so the number one rule for detoxification, type it in. First person that gets it right gets a free gluten-free warrior t-shirt. I'm going to come back and answer that question in just a minute. Do meat process companies ever put meat glue in meat without our knowledge? That's a possibility. And that's why you ask. You know, if you're taking your meat that you grow on your own land, um, then then you know the, the truth of the matter is, you know, that's pure meat. But now you're taking it to somebody else to potentially process it. You, you have to ask that question. You have to have that conversation with the butcher. So we're getting lots of answers here. So the question was, what's the number one rule of detox? And so number one rule of detox, and this is, it's very specific, the number one rule of detox. And so we've got, let's just read some of the answers that we got. Cynthia says, don't eat it. Maxine says, get it out of your diet. Christy says, fasting. Lynn says, stop eating bad food. Jane Jones says to fast. Uh, Elizabeth says, avoid any food product with meat glue. I like Marie's answer, follow no grain, no pain. I'm, I'm biased that way. Thanks, Marie, for the shout out. Um, let's see. Technically, nobody's gotten the, the exact answer the way I want it worded yet. Um, the number one rule of detox, and, and this is for any detox, the number one rule. So keep trying. We're going to come back to it. Uh, let's see here. He 
keep going. Uh, we ran out down there. We still got answers coming in. Um, keep scrolling down there. Let's see if we got anybody with the right ones. A lot of good guesses, so that's good because I'm going to be teaching you all something tonight. And I know some of you know the answer. You're just not wording it the way I want it, want it worded. Uh, the number one rule of a detox, number one rule. So a lot of you, it's funny because a lot of you are angling toward what to take or what not to eat. But... I'm going to go ahead and answer this question, and we're going, to, we're going to give it to the person who got it the most right first. So back it up on the left. Keep going, keep going a little further. So that would have been Cynthia, because your answer was correct, but it wasn't what I was looking for. Cynthia said, don't eat it. The number one rule of any detox is to not retox. And what I mean by that, so whatever it is that's, that's creating the toxic effect, you, you, have to, you have to avoid that first because no amount of pills, no amount of, fa no amount of uh, let's say, because if the toxin is not edible, if the toxin is breathable, you know, then fasting is not going to do it. Um, and, you know, taking more vitamin C is not going to overcome continued exposure to a toxin. Taking any supplement is not going to overcome that. So the number one rule in any detoxification program is to not retox. And so you have to eliminate where the toxin is coming from. And that means filters, right? Your body shouldn't be the major filter. You should filter your air. You should filter your water. You should filter through the lens of intelligence and discernment. You should filter your food choice so that your body doesn't have to do all the detoxification work and become overwhelmed. So we're going to send you a T-shirt. Um, uh, let's see, who won that again? Uh, Cynthia. Cynthia. Yeah, we're going to send you a T-shirt, Cynthia. So thanks for participating in... Uh, in the live Q&A tonight. So just um, get, with, get with Mel um, or get with, uh, get with my team, get with Jessica at glutenology at gmail.com and we're going we're gonna to pass along your information over to her so that she can get, get a hold of you and make sure you get the right shirt. The only thing we ask of you to do is take a nice picture and send it over to us. Okay, let's we'll see if we got any more questions before we wrap it up tonight. Yeah, the answer was too obvious, wasn't it? I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Everybody's thinking for that deeper answer, but sometimes it's just super obvious. And um, anyway, I think we got. I think this. I think this has got to be a record um, where we where we got through. I think most of the questions. There were there were several questions that I didn't answer because they were just so far off topic that I just didn't want to dilute uh, early on the show. But hey. Thanks for joining me on Monday night. I'm going to go home and have dinner, and I hope that you do the same and have real food, not meat glue. Uh, I'm personally going to have tonight's a ribeye. I'm going home and I get to barbecue it. So um, I hope you have a great meal. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you next Monday for another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. And again, make sure you come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. If you're not already, sign up for our newsletter there. We'll send you a bunch of free information that might just save your life. And if you think this information has been helpful for you, please do us a favor. Our goal and our mission here is to save 100 million lives. So we appreciate you sharing this information and helping us get it out there. With all the censorship, it's harder and harder to reach folks. But, uh, but we're going to reach that goal. Hashtag save 100 million lives. You guys have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday for Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is going to allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also going to allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.